for many of us, death is a thought, a topic that brings up fear and often avoidance. And yet death is something that each one of us will face. And every person that we know, every person that we love will face death also. Death is a part of our everyday lives. And the more consciously that we explore it, for most people, the better that experience becomes and the less fear that there is around it. Death can help us define more fully how we want to live. And as we learn more about death and our own thoughts and feelings about it, it often helps shape how each of us lives today and choices that we make around our own dying. Death becomes less fearful, which allows for us to have closer and deeper relationships because we're not carrying that fear of the loss and can I go through it and how could I possibly support the person I love or what will it mean in my own life when I'm the one who's dying. This project was conceived in order to bring more consciousness to the area of dying and death. It is hoped that by listening to a person, Nancy McMullen, who was willing to share her experience as she faced death, that each of us can think more about her experience and get clearer about our own and become less avoidant. Nancy had this interview which she had wanted to do in order to be speaking of her thoughts around dying and actually died 10 days following when the interview was done. We will in this experience have time with Nancy talking about her different thoughts related to her death and we will also have time where we are speaking of people who were present with her and how that experience went for them. What did it mean to be present? Thank you very much, Nancy, for your willingness to talk about your process. And it's such an important process, the one of going through your dying. So if you would just say some words about where you are. OK. Um, <laughs> I, um, a long time ago, well, actually, it's probably several months ago, I was on several kinds of chemo, and none of it was working. I stayed in stage four for um, ever. I never got out of stage four. And then I tried a trial drug, and when the trial um, didn't work, I decided I didn't want to try more chemo and feel bad when I was feeling really good. So I um, elected not to do any more chemo and feel good for the rest of my life. And um, then I, you know, I had to start the letting go of, well, this is healing or is this healing or, um, you know, what, what is it? And I just, so I just let go of everything and let it go wherever it goes. Nancy's cancer had metastasized from the very beginning when it was diagnosed, and she was given a poor prognosis for survival. Nancy tried every treatment, changed doctors, and put her consciousness into finding how to live and survive, and at a certain point became aware that that was no longer an option. Nancy will talk some about how she faced this, and a decision which, as she states in some ways, was not really a decision she made, but one that was what was happening. And if you would say something about making decisions, these are mm. such big decisions that you're making at this time. You know, actually, it, it didn't seem like a big decision. Um, and I think maybe it was because I, um, had been thinking about it for a long, long time, um, probably right from the beginning, because the very first doctor I saw said he couldn't help me. That was 16 or 17 months ago. And um, so I fired him and went to somebody else. And she's kept me going for 16 months. So um, 
then I decided that all through that time that that since I felt so well after I got to feeling really well that I would rather just feel well and live than take chemo and possibly not feel well and not go into remission and um, and live my life on the couch which I didn't want to do so I'm uh, living every day as much as I can. What has been the most helpful to you? Hmm, my garden. Uh -huh. <laughs> my, uh, I had a master gardener come out and plan the garden and then my son came up and planted it and I um, have been obsessing over it ever since. And it's wonderful. I go out at 5.30 in the morning and pluck the little dead flowers off and have a good time communicating with my plants. What do you need in the way of support from oh, friends and family? Um, I just need to know that people are there and um, if, if, I, if I do need something that I can pick up the phone and, and say, could you possibly do this or do you know somebody who could do this? Um, I think, I, you know, I haven't really asked for much help yet. And so it's that's kind of a new charted territory that I'm just just kind of going into. If you would talk some of your beliefs about your death and about dying. Hmm. Well, my beliefs I think have changed over the course of time. Um, at first I was totally okay with it. Um, you know, whatever happens, happens. And then as things really did begin to happen and um, I thought, oh, I don't know if I want this to happen now. Um, but then I realized I, I, I couldn't do anything about it. So um, I just kind of went with whatever happens. I, you know, whatever, whatever happens, happens. I, I, I don't feel like I have a whole lot of control over what does happen one way or the other. I know that you had, when you made the decision to stop doing chemo, since chemo wasn't working anyway, I know that you had at that time made the decision that you wanted to investigate um, physician-assisted suicide. Right. Would you say a little bit about that? Yes, I um, did. I printed out the papers um, at the very first, way, way, way back when, threw them on the shelf and never looked at them for about six or seven months and then decided I better get those out and see what they are. And it was a pack that was about this high and I thought, oh no. <coughs> but um, it turned out that, that they are very, very helpful. Um, a, a doctor from there called and talk me through the whole thing. This is what you do next, and this is what you do next, and um, it was very, very simple. And they were very supportive. And you had stated that to have that sense of control, whether right. you ever use it or not, right. gave you more peace of mind. Right, right. I, I probably won't use it, but you're right. Um, the little bit of control that it gives is enough to um, to make it um, worth doing all the, the work to do it, you know, to, to get there, um, whether I use it or not. And apparently a large percentage of people don't use it. They just, they want it for that control. Uh -huh. So. As you go through this time, and I certainly heard what you stated of, making the decision and then having days where it's scary to have made that decision. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit more both about your hopes for the time and your fears in the time. Um, my hopes are that I go fast. Uh -huh. um, my fear is that I won't, that um, um, 
lost my train of thought. My, my fear is that it's going to happen so fast that I won't know that it's happening, which doesn't really make sense, but um, it does to me somehow inside um, that um, you know the um, I don't know the the, the process. Um, what do I want to say? As Nancy came closer to her time of dying, she made many decisions that were important. She decided that she wanted to have hospice involved and that she wanted to die at home. She decided that she wanted to investigate assisted suicide because she, though she didn't want to use it, she had a sense that it would give her more a sense of control and would help her have less fear about possible pain or suffering she might go through. She also got very clear that she wanted her death to be a time of connection, support, and love. And with that in mind, she began to think through the forming of a transition team. She first called it her death group, and some of the members stated, couldn't we have a softer word? So she did come up with her transition team to support her through her dying. She asked who would be willing to serve on this team and helped people to explore what it would mean and the kind of courage or willingness to have her talk about her death, to be present when she began to have physical changes that people would need to be willing to do in order to serve on such a team. A meeting was called and members gathered together actually a week before uh, Nancy died, I thought, as did others, that we had perhaps two or three months in which we'd be meeting together, forming a team, making plans. Transition teams often think through how can we support the household during this time of dying and what would be the food that her partner or friends and family who are present might need how to provide any kind of relief or connection, how to be with Nancy in that time. So the group gathered and people shared what it was that they felt they could offer and it was agreed that we'd be meeting on a fairly regular basis. After we met one time, six days later, Nancy entered the active dying process. It was a powerful time and our team came together in the way only this kind of experience provides, where each person open to a, like a bigger consciousness that allows for knowing things that you don't know when you're involved in your own personal world. And there was a dance together, a way things were orchestrated by each one of us that allowed for a sense of safety and peacefulness and support for each person present and most especially for Nancy. And Nancy had a very peaceful dying with so much love and the things that she'd asked for. She had wanted live music and Elaine showed up with a mandolin and a harp player was coming in at a later time too. She had stated that she wanted for each person to feel safe and okay and we always had the awareness of Nancy wanting a thousand white paper cranes to be made in the process of her dying and to have us make those cranes for her. She had heard the story of them and she wasn't sure why it was so important to her, but I believe it was something she intuitively knew would bring us together as a community. And even after her dying, we still have hundreds of cranes still to be made since she died so quickly and community members connect together and talk and remember Nancy as we make our white paper cranes. The, I, I think the, the biggest fear is facing when um, Drew, the original um, hospice nurse, came out and I showed her a new spot and she, um, she said, yeah, that's a new one or something like that. And it was like, oh no, you know, I changed my mind. I don't want to do this and then but it was just like a split second and I was back to it's okay 
you know, and and it it never along the way do I remember making some big huge decision, you know, other than this is the way it has to go. I mean, whatever way it goes, it it has to go that way. It certainly seems as if in the course of the time since you first got diagnosed that you have explored and really worked hard to move into the direction of a remission or healing mm -hmm. and at a certain point when your tumors kept growing and you could feel them growing and the right. chemo wasn't working the decision that I'm going to let go of trying to stop this since nothing has worked and right. there's no suggestions about it. And there's there's no way, you know, there's nothing to do. I mean, I, I can make a decision, you know, I, I don't want to die, but that's not going to help me um, in the end. You know, it just, it didn't seem like a big decision. And, and I know in group, people keep bringing up the fact that I've made some great decision, but I don't feel like I have. Um, I think that's important because I think sometimes we look at it that way, like you've made a decision to move in this direction of dying rather than to continue a process of trying to live. And when you've been told that there aren't any other treatments that are going to work for you, in a way it's accepting that this is now the course that's open for you. Right. And I know you do everything holistically with I massage try. and acupuncture and naturopathic support too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've tried um, just about everything, I think. I think I've tried everything that uh, Project Quest offers and have. What are the changes that you've noticed as you've made this shift? In myself? Yes. Um, I've noticed, I, I maybe have let myself notice more pain than I did before. I think I was denying that there was any at all. And there's, there is quite a bit of bone pain, but I, I do have medications that I can take for it. So, it, it, you know, it's not unbearable, and it's certainly a heck of a lot better than um, chemo overload, you know, that <laughs> does nothing. So... I would rather I would rather go this way than than just lie in the chair and wait for chemo to do nothing. And how are you managing the pain? With medications, Morf uh -huh. morphine and um, oxycodone and decadron, and the three of those working together are um, it's doing the trick. Uh huh. I hardly have any pain at all. So it seems like it's a special time for you with your family, that your daughters come and others have come to spend time with you. How mm -hmm. is that? It's wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I couldn't do it without them. Uh -huh. it, um, it means a lot to get support from wherever, but you know, when your own family can step up and, and um, give you support, it's it's really wonderful. And what is the support that you most especially need? Um, I think for me, it's it's um, acknowledging and accepting and um, understanding where I am and being okay with it. I mean, even if they're not totally okay with it, they're okay with it. <clears throat> you know, other than not wanting it to happen, but. Well, I, I believe think. that people being able to stay present and talk with you and share <laughs> with you, because sometimes family members get scared and back away. Yeah. And get scared of Kelly, questions. Kelly has, um, she's always come forward and, and asked questions, pertinent questions, and um, stayed right there. And um, my youngest daughter, kind of does it in a different way. She's um, more removed, but she's, she's there. You mm -hmm. know, she, uh, she kind of asks from a, a more distant place. But I, th I, th I think she's, um, I, I, I know she's um, accepting of it and she acknowledges it.
So it sounds like knowing that your family is accepting of where you are and willing to talk with you about it, right. that they're not backing away, is really important right. for you. Right. Yeah. We'll see how it goes in the end, but right now I'm, um, I'm okay with it. You know, I, I'm sure there'll be times when, you know, when there's scary times, and um, you know, the the other day, like there was, I knew if I. <laughs> I knew if I, if I sat down, I got down there on the, on the patio and I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I knew if I sat down, that would be the end. So I just kept going, you know, and going and going and going and going. And then finally that passed and, and I could sit down. But it was uh, very strange. Did you have a feeling that if, if I stopped moving, my whole body would stop? So um, I just get moving. And that you wouldn't be able to get up again? Right, or? right, yeah. Uh -huh. So you're noticing differences within your body with right, what you can do right. and what you can't do. Every now and then, um, out of nowhere comes my right arm, and it's like, where did that come from? You know, it's, it's like it came out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> but your arms just move differently? Well, I don't know if it moved differently. It just it came out of a place where I wouldn't expect it to. But um, once I realized it was my arm, it was okay. So there's even different sensations in your body, mm -hmm. and sometimes your body just moves, and uh -huh. <laughs> you're not sure of where it came from. And there's other times when um, things look like they're framed. Uh huh. Um, but the frame is getting wider and wider, so so it looks like it's getting further away too. Uh -huh. And um, sometimes I feel like I need to back up to fit the frame on, on the picture onto the frame. So there's a number of different bodily sensations <laughs> and ways you see things that right. are different. Right. Which yeah. certainly might be. Both and they'll be different for everybody. You know, everyone probably has their own little process that they that they go through. You know, that maybe it's their left arm. <laughs> uh huh. But there's changes. There's changes. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. In talking with people, what has been helpful from others around you? The support that I've been getting in group has been tremendous. Um, I could not. I would not have survived this long if I didn't have um, Project Quest and, and HEP. I know there's no way that I could do it. And I, I looked for almost a year for a support group and couldn't find one. Uh -huh. And um, so I was so fortunate when I found, and then I found all this other stuff that came with it, you know, it was like, wow. But the Arquette Cancer Program has a lot of different offerings. Yes, and it's amazing. It was great. So what has helped you in support group? How has it made such a difference? Um, for the Breast Cancer Notebook, which is the main group that I attend, there is um, the, um, would you ask me, the major? Oh, the group has helped oh. you. Um, it just by my being able oops, to say um, whatever it is I need to say and have it be okay, you know, I because some of the things I say are pretty deep, and this is not I'm, I'm the only one in the group that's in this position, and I didn't know how. Um, how much they could take, and I didn't know, you know, I, ha I had no um, point where to say, okay, this is enough or this isn't enough, and they seemed to um, help me say, you know, this is, we want, we want to hear it, and um, we want to support you, and um, it's worked out really well. Every woman in your support group, your breast cancer support group, 
has been willing and wants to be a part of your transition team? I probably have the largest transition team <laughs> that anyone's ever had. I think there's something like 25 people that wanted to join it. Uh huh. So it's it's and great. Say a bit about having a transition team and what it means. And well, um, I don't know a whole lot about a transition team. I, I'm um, we met a couple of weeks ago and we're meeting again this coming week um, to put one together. To you know, to w what does it comprise of? What 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 types of um, jobs can people be doing? What are people willing to do? What are people not willing to do? Because um, I certainly don't want people pushed into something that they're not willing to give out. Um, there are plenty of people to go around for everything. I think that the willingness of people to be present and to not back away in fear, and it seems in the breast cancer support group like the capacity people have to cry and to feel a lot and to let you know that they don't want you to die, but they'll be with you through thick and thin is pretty important. Very important. And seems very, very genuine. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, I, I, w I was surprised. I really was. Um, I knew people would be shocked when they finally heard, but um, that it had shifted. Yeah. And you were going to be moving into dying and getting hospice and right once people hear the word hospice they think it's over and that really isn't the case because some people go into hospice and um, go out of hospice because they're they're not ready uh -huh. so um, I don't know which end I'll be but and what has it meant to you in having hospice hospice is wonderful um, they provide everything. They provide all my drugs. They provide, um, if I have to call 911, I call them first and they take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, I call them first no matter what. If I need to call the doctor, they call the doctor. Um, everything has been taken out of my hands. So they do it. And that's pretty wonderful. That's great. Yeah. That area, again, of control where you know that there are people who are experienced who can support you and help your loved ones, too, to be with you mm -hmm. and that they'll know how to take care of you and keep you free from pain. That's a biggie, yeah, keeping away from the pain. Um, they can keep me pain-free, yeah, go forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So... In your own thoughts and beliefs around the dying process, what do you envision? You may not have thought that much about it. Well, um, I have done a lot of reading, and one of the books that I have been reading is called Who Dies by Stephen Levine. And I, I don't know if it's okay to say his name, but um, he, at the end of his book, he and his wife wrote it, and there are three or four meditations at the end that explain step by step what they think your body does at the end. You know, this this feeling ends now, this other feeling ends now. Um, and it was really helpful because I have no idea, you know, um, even if it isn't true at all, at least it gives me an idea that something stops and something else starts, you know. So um, that was really helpful. So looking at books and getting an idea that resonates with you, mm -hmm. that there is a kind of detachment and change that occurs, and it occurs somewhat naturally, mm -hmm. has been helpful. Yeah. We'll see how natural it is. <laughs> but um, so far, you know, there have been no problems. Um, as I said, going to group has been the biggest. It's been the biggest help. It really has. In my experience, Nancy, of being with people during that time of transition and into their period of death, it has actually had me be much less afraid of dying because it has been a process that has been natural and 
one that when there are people around supporting you, I believe, it helps there be a sense of peacefulness and love that holds you safely through well, as you... I have felt that, yes. Um, and it's so important. It really is. That, that uh, sense of love and, and commitment and community, it, it's just, um, it's, I, I can't even think of words that, you know, make it that important. It's, uh, it's great. Two days after Nancy's death, the support group that had been very important to Nancy, the Breast Cancer Notebook Group, which is a group that is meant to allow folks living with breast cancer to explore in depth their experience, experiences around living and experiences around dying. This group was meeting at its regular time and the members were gathering together and had decided that they wanted to have Nancy's daughter, Kelly, present, and other people who had been part of the dying experience. It is so important for people who have been present to have time to share their feelings and to have an experience together, again, of processing all that comes up when you are present in something that's such a big experience and for many people a first time. It's especially important in a group where Many folks have cancer, some with first occurrences, and to be present with an experience like this where one of your member dies from the disease that you have can be a frightening thing. It's very important to process and to find clarity and understanding that supports your own life and the meaning for each person present. We are here to um, be together and part of it is to really process some of the things that we went through and to honor Nancy and also to remember the importance of loving each other and of keeping each other safe and in this time of grieving because if you are grieving and you feel like you can't cry or you can't talk about it often we start shutting down if I avoid what's coming up for me I'm apt to start forming barriers that'll have me be less present and less able to really grieve and then my heart's not as open and my heart isn't as able to be joyful or receive love either so and grieving is a process that is years and I believe when we grieve for someone we love it's kind of a lifelong process but you do move more into where you can feel all the joyfulness and the things that you had and the last thing I want to say about that is I think that when we have a great and wondrous woman like Nancy who was on such a long and arduous healing path as she was, made so many changes in her life, there's something that each one of us learns. And so I believe that when a person like Nancy dies, she actually lives on through the hearts of each of us and through the things that are the Nancy things that we bring into the world. And so I think that that's something that we'll be thinking of and I'm sure sharing more at her memorial that there's some way that Nancy and the things that she taught us, we will continue on and help bring into the world. Uh, certainly her willingness and courage, like wanting for there to be something that taught people about death because it's such a scary thing for so many people, and her willingness in her very, very vulnerable state to talk with all of us. I mean, I was ready to leave on Monday, drive home with my boyfriend, thinking that she still had anywhere maybe from, I mean, I could come back up in two weeks and it might happen then or two, a month or whatever. So I was comfortable doing that. I mean, I was going to leave with all of you because I was just like okay <laughs> things are things are good because I knew that that should be taken care of and even if it happened and I couldn't get back you know if I was driving back up or flying back up and she had you know it's just I felt okay with that and when I first got here I didn't know I was just like no I've got to be there you know, I've got to be there because who else is going to be there and then I got here and I found all you guys and I was like ah so Glad I was definitely here for it, um, but that's how important I think this is. 
Well, I really believe part of the reason Nancy's transition was so peaceful was that she knew that she'd given us all that gift, and she participated in it. She knew. She saw what was happening with all of us. I think when I said, you know, I saw the heart and the light, I think that that's, she knew that. And she was very happy that what she started out as a goal was happening. That there was more than just her passing. That was a big thing to her. And I think she saw all of that happening. What I didn't expect was the, the next day. Because that amount of hours and that intensity. And then I went home to my house, which is a very nice house. And, you know, there I was in my house. Kind of went, huh. There was really a void. After the intense number of hours, I just felt this big void. And I couldn't have said, oh, I'm not depressed. What, what is this? And there was just this void, the missing this, the bonding, the finishing. And I just thought about Nancy a lot and about what she had accomplished, what she'd given us as well as what we gave her. But that morning, it was about 8 o'clock in the morning, and she passed at about 4.20ish or something, like 4.30 in the morning and for some reason I just it was eight o'clock and I just stuck my head in there you know and the, the blinds were about halfway up and there was the sun was right on her face yeah. and I believe we left her with her face up and yes. her eyes were turned closed turned you had turned, I went in there and her head was turned towards the window and one eye was open and the yeah. sun was just beaming on her face mm. and I swear to God I'm like <laughs> how did she do that <laughs> I mean, it was just like wow so I got everybody going you guys gotta see this yeah. this is Sunbeam right on her face, and she's all smirking and looking out the window. I'm like, that Nancy smirk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, whoa. So that was Kelly. So many times I was so touched by your tenderness, mm -hmm. you know. And I thought, when I die, I want my call me up, baby. I'll be there. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, don't. Kelly. I, I wondered if because it takes so much maturity to be able to do that, and I wondered how my kids would be with me. I mean, I certainly thought about that. Would they be able to give that kind of tenderness? And, you know, when you actually crawled in bed with her, that was cool. and just that could share that space I dreamed that her. she died, though, and I woke up and I had to do it all over again. It was horrible. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't horrible, it was, it was fine, but it was just like, I actually seriously thought that she had passed, and Carla was helping me get up, because I was kind of crammed in against the rail, and I saw Glenda holding her hand, and I'm like, oh good, Glenda's in here. She gets to be with mom after she passed. And I got to the end of the bed, and I was sitting on the end like this, and I went, what the? She's still breathing, and it was about 40 <laughs> minutes before she passed. So I was just like, uh, uh, completely, you know, and delirious by that point, because, you know, I'm not sleeping a lot. So if people would speak of things personally that came for you in being there or anything about it, it's like we shared a miraculous thing. And, and to be included, thinking about it, to be felt so special to be in, included in Nancy's transition team and just how she knew what we all needed, or at least what I needed you to be there. Right. To, I was totally amazed with myself. <laughs> you should be. I was worried about you. I'm like, because every time I would say, would you want to come sit with mom? You know, it turned out we didn't really have to, the need for all of that, but you're like, you mean you were, you, and no. I was glad for your honesty. You're like, well, I don't really feel comfortable, you know, staying alone with her because I mean, it was hard. You had to lift her. Get, and it was, nobody should have been alone trying to do that. And so, I mean, I can see a little bit of that kind of nervous anxiety and uh, phew, once you were there, you were just part of the team and <laughs> you were yeah it took me a little while to to get close to her and and to and to touch her and then quite a while for me to sit by her head and 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 touch her touch her head and caress her head but I felt very yeah, privileged to be gave, there give in. that's what she did to the end she just you know, give 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 I'm gonna give Nancy this gift <laughs> to be able to be there you know be present with, with people because it's it's just part of life I mean it's I mean, I've never been a friend. I mean, I didn't. I was gonna say I enjoyed it, but I um, wouldn't want to do it any other way. And then I want to say that I think probably I had a hard time getting to sleep after I went home, and I felt something about the time you said she passed. And I don't, I don't know even how to explain what it was, but I just felt for a brief moment something different 
around me. And the connection, I didn't feel the connection. And then when I put my hand on her heart, it was like, oh, Nancy, okay. And it all like, uh -huh. the whole feeling of connection and like, <coughs> who I know, her spirit was like, there you are, okay. Mm -hmm. And it was just really comforting to right. get connected back in. Just, I mean, the whole process was very, very touching for me, and I just felt so gifted to be a part of it. And honest to God, I slept by your head because I didn't want to leave for a second. <laughs> well, that was, was a nice piece, I think, that you did, Carla, where you helped different people from all the things that you know, mm -hmm. sense how you can tune in energy-wise and know a lot about a person. And there's ways to communicate with people, even when they seem really far away. Yeah. And it's funny because even though someone's dying and everyone knows how dramatic that is, mm -hmm. I had there were parts where I really had a lot of fun. But I also knew that because I was there for a purpose, that I really paid attention to that. And my purpose was to make sure that somebody was conscious. People were being taken care of and that someone was always conscious. Well, it's another way that made me confirm the fact that she was conscious of what was going on. Yeah. Because that was one of the things she wanted was to be as conscious of everything as she could yeah. for as long as she could. So even though we didn't have our usual way of communicating, that sort of pulse responding, that kind of thing was like, yep, yeah, it's not just my imagination. Okay. She really is conscious of all this. She really is orchestrating this. This is possible. And I think we all did our own little journeys. Yeah. I mean, every one yeah, of us. Yeah. Such a gift. I mean, I'm I saw how peaceful she was, and she, I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, there was nothing, there was no turmoil, nothing. And, and she, yeah, she, she just, just was like kind of sleeping, and she got farther and farther away, but she was sleeping, and she looked happy, and she looked like she was enjoying everybody around, yeah. and the mm -hmm. love, and... It just it totally a scary. It does, it really does. And when, if it, my anxiety comes up, I just kind of say, oh, remember, it was really, you know, it was really peaceful. It was just an exquisite, graceful, poignant experience in that she, she had her purpose, and I, I agree with Kay that she wanted us all to be together, and I remember being really freaked out at one moment before I knew that she was going. I was like, how are we going to get everyone together? And it just happened. And so she had that energy. Mm -hmm. Believe, yeah. yeah. Yes. If you just trusted mm -hmm. and you paid yeah. attention to the energy, each one of you ended up with a role. And it was the right so, one. I mean, and, the so roles right on. and the roles changed. Yeah, I mean, yeah they did. Did. That's why yeah. I said, I, I, said <clears throat> I felt comfortable leaving, you know, going back to California. but. I felt comfortable, you know, leaving, and even when I was outside, I was like, you know, I finished my, I'm a drinker, you know, just sit outside and talk with someone, and I, I kept thinking, well, you know, at first I was like, well, what if she passes away while I'm not in there, and then I finally realized, like, well, that's fine, <laughs> you know, that, and it really was, and that helped me relax for when I was in there, and so it was, you know, just, there was so, the energy was just, what I wanted the most was love, and that in that field of love where there's a great sense of trust, you knew when to play the mandolin, and Pat knew when to put the wonderful oils on her feet, and Heather giving her energy, and they're just each and person painting her toenails. <laughs> I had a sense of you know when you walk into your house and it's been cleaned really well and tidied up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's I wanted to say someone came in and uh, did it. Oh, um, it was just so natural. You know, I was thinking well, this is like a bird. Well, I think there is a model that we all get when you're around. It's like if you're at a birth and you get a feeling, that's how I'd like to give birth. And mm -hmm. Like you get a different way of doing it. And I think when you're present in the circle as we were, you can think through, like, I want to have music. <laughs> yes, I want to have these folks here. Yeah. And, 
Um, you could even think through who you did well, want there. Well, that makes it conscious. <laughs> you know, it's not like, oh, God, it's it just is. the conscious part. Yeah, it's like, okay. it, it, and it's okay to think about it. Like, you know, it could be. It's important to think about six it. months or it could be in 20 years. Well, I mean, for me, it was I wanted to be more conscious in my daily living now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It changed my priority more days to go by where I'm not focused on relationships, where I'm not focused on what, you know, transitioning is only part of whatever it is. But it didn't help me with just, okay, down the road I want it to be like that. It helped me with, you know, I really need to be aiming towards that now. And even that might honor Nancy if I am a little more conscious in my living every day. We gathered together to process the experience of Nancy's death and what it meant to each person and to support one another. We attended her memorial service and again each one of us had a chance to speak and we had more of the paper cranes present, strands to go with each of her children in memory of their mother's wish and with her partner Glenda. We will continue to meet and process and there will be things that come up over time and as other people become ill and as other people move on towards more health this connection and all that was learned will be a part of it. It was an incredible experience and one that deepened and enriched the life of each of us who participated. This is Nancy's contribution something she wanted to support others in exploring conscious living and conscious dying. And conscious living does involve exploring what does my death mean for me and how can I be present with those I love as they move into that process as they will.